Morning, church. Good to see you all today. I, uh, I was wearing a sweater earlier because it's snowing and seemed appropriate, and I got way too hot. Uh, so just now I went and grabbed a uh, Antioch shirt off the rack. Um, so after this, I'll give you a good deal if you want to <laughs> buy this. <laughs> Or if you're interested in a sweaty sweater. Uh, uh, good to have our service in Bethlehem this morning. And uh, it'll be fun tonight to gather um, with the Antioch kids for our Christmas pageant. My son Mo built this uh, stable and manger. <laughs> he's, uh, he's 11 and he drew it all out 3D and made a lumber list and made all the cuts and all the nails. So pretty cool, and uh, it's going to be his, uh, his home for the rest of the year. <laughs> we'll be uh, in the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, if you want to turn there with me, and uh, it's one of those table of contents books, so I'll give you a second to get there. And um, it's a really beautiful passage um, that Emma just read for us. Um, one of the more emotive passages we have in the entirety of Scripture when it comes to giving us a glimpse of God's inner world, um, the way that the prophet gives us a kind of behind-the-scenes look at the heart of God and the way it beats for his people. And so uh, Zephaniah is um, one of what we call the minor prophets, and um, he prophesied during the reign of King Josiah, around 600 years before the time of Jesus. And Zeph Zephaniah um, paints a picture, like many of the other modern prophets, uh, minor prophets, excuse me, of a world full of what we might call social and spiritual disaster. So he describes a corrupt and perverted world, and in the midst of it, he announces God's determination to restore peace and harmony or shalom to all of his creation. And so things are bad, and we won't spend the time to detail all of that, but um, things are bad, and any time things are bad, back then or now, it raises questions, doesn't it? Especially for those of us who worship a God who we believe to be both good and powerful. When things are bad, when there's loss, when there's death, when there's disaster, when there's tragedy, how on earth could a God who's both good and powerful allow those things to happen? Makes us wonder, is this God actually in control? Can we actually trust what the biblical witness claims to be true about God? Because if there really was a good God who was so good and so powerful, then how could there be so much sin and evil and pain and corruption and injustice in the world? Why wouldn't God do something about it? Because if he's really good, um, then he would want to do something. And if he was really powerful, then he'd be able to do something. So what if he's maybe not good, like he has the power, but he chooses not to use it? Or what if he's not powerful, like he wishes he could do something, but he can't? So the question then and now is, does God even care when things go bad in the world? And what Zephaniah does today is gives us a peek of what God has to say to his people when things are bad and when there's no sign that they're gonna get better anytime soon. So this is where we pick up the story in Zephaniah. It's a short little book, as you can see, three chapters long. And if you go back and read the first two and a half chapters, you'll see that it's all bad news. Um, but then these last seven verses of the book, verses 14 through 20, that we're looking at this morning, um, the tone changes, the message changes, and it switches to good news. And so you'll even notice that this morning, as we have been singing Advent hymns for the last couple of weeks, this morning we start to sing more Christmas songs. 
This is the place in the church calendar, this third Sunday of Advent, where the, our anticipation moves from simply kind of a longing and a waiting to a preparing and a joyful anticipation, where we start to proclaim that it's soon, that God is coming in Jesus. And so for these final seven verses... God turns to the Israelites in light of all that's going on, and he's warned them that um, not only are things bad, but they're about to get worse, that the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar are about to invade and conquer Jerusalem. They're going to ravage the city and destroy the temple. They're going to capture the Israelites, deport them back to Babylon, where they're forced to become slaves. And so this is what we call the Babylonian exile and a defining moment in the story of God's people. In the midst of that, here's how Zephaniah begins this section. Sing, daughters of Zion. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. So if you're paying attention to the context of the great biblical narrative and even just specifically of the flow of Zephaniah, this comes out of absolutely nowhere. Things are bad. God's just promised that they're going to get even worse. And what does God have to say about that? Sing. Shout for joy. Rejoice with all your heart. Doesn't fit their context. Doesn't fit our context either. We also live in a world, great social and spiritual disorder. We also live in a world where we long for peace and restoration, restoration for God's divine intervention to show up. So this sounds just as crazy to us as it does to the first readers. And so here we see Zephaniah being faithful to the prophetic task with, which often requires declaring an unimaginable hope in the midst of brokenness and chaos. That's God's word for his people in this moment. And the word is rejoice, be glad, sing, and shout. Theologian Karl Barth described biblical joy as a defiant nonetheless. Nonetheless, in the midst of chaos, brokenness, injustice, and oppression, nonetheless, rejoice. So how on earth could God tell his people then and now to rejoice in a time like this? We'll move on, verse 15. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He's turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. It's an incredibly important passage to pay close attention to. The author here uses a form of parallelism. So he makes a statement in the first line, and then in the next line, he restates the same truth, but using different words or from a different perspective. So in this verse, verse 15, he states firstly that the Lord has taken away their punishment, and then in the next line, he makes a parallel statement that God has turned back their enemies. And so there's, there are two lines that aren't quite interchangeable. They're not identical in their meaning, but they are stating the same truth from two different angles or perspectives. So that's called parallelism, and it's used all throughout the Bible, especially in a lot of the poetic and prophetic passages. So now look at the second half of verse 15. The first line says, the Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Okay, this is a statement that God is present among you. And the second line says, never again will you fear any harm. So these aren't just two statements randomly listed one after the other. These are parallel statements meaning they say the same thing, but in different words or from a different perspective. And so here's what's so beautiful in this verse. If we un want to understand the meaning of this first line, we have to look at the second line. And so another way of asking 
the question of parallelism is what questions do the parallel lines ask of each other? So if the first line makes this pretty bold statement or claim that God is with you, the question we're left asking is, well, how can I know that God is with me? And the second line responds to that question. You know God is with you when you're no longer afraid. You know God is with you when you're no longer afraid. We have lots of Advent and Christmas traditions in our home, and we try to follow them every year. And um, one, of the, one of the first ones we do on the first day of Advent is watch Charlie Brown Christmas. And uh, kind of that first, first little video gets us going. And so if you remember Charlie Brown Christmas, at the very beginning of the story, Chuck is in pretty bad shape. And he's so depressed over the commercialization of Christmas, and even his own dog is getting in on it. And so he goes to uh, Lucy for some psychiatric help, and uh, he tries to kind of explain the problem. And if you remember, Dr. Lucy tries to diagnose Charlie Brown's depression by listing a bunch of different phobias and seeing if any of those resonate with him. So she suggests maybe a fear of staircases or a fear of the ocean or a fear of cats, and none of those are quite right. And finally, she throws out pantophobia. She goes, do you think you have pantophobia? And Charlie Brown asks, what's pantophobia? And Lucy says, what? The fear of everything. <laughs> and Charlie Brown says, that's it. <laughs> The fear of everything. I don't know that most of us would be diagnosed with pantophobia. But it doesn't seem like too far of a stretch when you think about where we are. In light of pushing two years now, trudging through pandemic life, social, political, relational conflict, it's not so much that there's a fear of everything, but there is this underlying angst and anxiety everywhere we turn. This cultural anxiety about <clears throat> the unknown that's in front of us, the polarization and the division that's all around us, the fear that's within us. Hesitate to share this because it's kind of a depressing observation, but <laughs> it's also kind of my style. So <laughs> if you think back one year ago to December of 2020, what I remember pretty well was that as we got close to the end of 2020, there was a kind of collective or cultural sense of hope. We were so ready for 2020 to be over and to turn the calendar to start a new year and say goodbye to all that and 2021 was gonna be the answer. I also remember December 2020, we had a new president that was going to be sworn in the next month. And for many people, there was an incredible sense of hope that we're out with the old, in with the new, things are finally going to change. I also remember in December 2020, we were starting to hear that there was gonna be a vaccine available. And as soon as this thing came out, then COVID would go away. There was a lot of stuff we were really hopeful about a year ago. There were a bunch of things that we collectively were going, as soon as this happens, then things will finally get back to normal. And it's been a year. <laughs> Flipping the calendar didn't help. New president, a vaccine, and yet here you are wearing masks. <laughs> Here we are, dividing 
in our churches, in our families, over all the, the stuff. As we sit here today, I haven't heard anybody say, man, I just can't wait till 2022. We learned our lesson, didn't we? <laughs> the calendar doesn't care. <laughs> whatever confidence we had in politics or a president or whatever hope we had in vaccines or medical advances or whatever, it's like everything we thought was gonna fix the world. It didn't, did it? And so we sit here going, yeah, a year ago we had hope. Now, I don't know, I don't even know what to say. I don't know if things ever get back to normal. That's my depressing observation, if you didn't <laughs> notice that. <laughs> what does that do to you? I mean, you may agree or disagree with me, but as you hear those observations, what does that do to you? Well, of course, it begins to well up fear and anxiety in us. Is this the way it goes? Is this the way this story is going to end? Is everything that's wrong with the world going to have the last word? That's the social aspect. The spiritual aspect is everything that's wrong with me going to have the last word. All of the things I look to for hope have not hollow. And so therefore, this thing, this pantophobia, this underlying angst and anxiety shows its face. And in the midst of that kind of social and spiritual brokenness, the word of the Lord comes to Zephaniah and he says, rejoice. Be glad. Sing and shout for joy. Why? Because God is with you. How do you know that God is with you? You know God is with you when you're no longer controlled by fear. I'm working on a doctorate uh, in ministry, doctorate of ministry. And, uh, you know, week, I've got my first major deadline for kind of an early sketch of what will end up being my dissertation. Um, I've had about six months to work on it, and uh, I've got a long ways to go. <laughs> um, some of you understand the struggle with either what you might call perfectionism or procrastination, and the two are deeply connected, aren't they? <laughs> By the way, when I say I'm perfectionist, it, mean, it doesn't mean I think I'm perfect. It means I'm hyper aware of all the ways that I'm not, right? Um, which then leads to this tendency to procrastinate in whatever it is that we're talking about, because I want the perfect scenario to sit down and write my paper. Right? I need the right amount of time, and I need the right volume level, and I need the right uh, mood in the room, and the right music, and the right feeling, because this is a big deal, and I got to do it right, so I'm going to sit down and carve out the time and start to write, and then I get a text, and that takes like 30 seconds, and now I don't have as much time as I needed, so <laughs> maybe tomorrow that perfect block of time will present itself. Um, anybody else, some of that sound kind of familiar? Okay. And uh, you can fake it in a lot of areas of life, but school is one of those where it's hard. <clears throat> and there's something in us, I think, whether you resonate with that or not, where we long for a world in which the circumstances are conducive to rejoicing. Of course we want to be people full of joy. Of course we want to be people who are happy. Of course we want to be people who are hopeful and full of life and have the, the deep courage to endure rough circumstances. We want to be that kind of person, but we need the right circumstances and settings and conditions in order to be that person. And if that's where we live, then we're going to keep waiting and waiting and waiting. I 
The Advent invitation is one to reject these perfectionistic and these uh, tendencies and these tendencies to procrastinate and to wait that as soon as the calendar flips, as soon as the White House flips, as soon as the medication or the vaccine comes, then, then we'll be okay, then I'll be okay. I don't dive into a lot of poetry. I don't get a lot of poetry. <laughs> Every once in a while I find one that I do get. And I want you to listen to this. It's a poem called First Coming, written by Madeline Langle. He did not wait till the world was ready, till men and nations were at peace. He came when the heavens were unsteady and prisoners cried out for release. He did not wait for the perfect time. He came when the need was deep and great. He dined with sinners in all their grime. He turned water into wine. He did not wait. Till hearts were pure in joy he came to a tarnished world of sin and doubt. To a world like ours of anguish shame he came and his light would not go out. He came to a world which did not mesh to heal its tangles, shield its scorn. In the mystery of the word made flesh, the maker of the stars was born. We cannot wait till the world is sane to raise our songs with joyful voice. For to share our grief, to share our pain, he came with love. Rejoice, rejoice. As much as that sounds like it may have been written in 2021, it was written in 1973 or something like that. For these last nearly two years, we've been reminded nearly daily of all the brokenness within the world and within ourselves. And we've had a front row seat to pain, division, fear. And these difficult stories, this underlying cultural angst and anxiety have become such a part of our lives, our daily lives, that we may not even be aware of them, but they're taking a toll. We're exhausted. But this week, as we hear this word from the Lord, that God will be with you and you won't be afraid. Of course, we do long for the ultimate return of Christ when he comes and makes the world new again, but the invitation of this season, not just of the calendar, but of the great narrative of God and his people is that we long for the awareness of God's presence and arrival, for God's advent in the here and now. That God is with us here, now. Not when things are perfect, not when the calendar reads the right year or the right people are in power or the right medical or technological advances come. All that matters. But God's presence is not dependent upon any of these things or any of the other circumstances that we would want to look to and say, once I do that, once I get there, then Biblical joy is the defiant nevertheless, that God is with us now. Leonard Cohen famously wrote, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. It's a reminder that it's not our perfection that brings joy. It's not perfecting ourselves from some sort of outside measure to validate us, but discovering the truth of who God is and who we are in him, to be uh, un un uncovering that sacred identity 
and being brave enough to share that precious vulnerability with one another. That's how presence brings hope. That's where joy comes from. So God promises that he's with us, and when he's with us, we will know it because we're no longer controlled by fear. But the good news doesn't stop there. In verse 17, Zephaniah declares, the Lord your God is with you. Again, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. These final three verses after this, 18 through 20, are some of the most beautiful in all of Scripture. Zephaniah tells us, on one hand, that we have a God who's like a mighty warrior or a king, but not the way you would picture it. He's a warrior or a king who rejoices over his people with tenderness expressed through singing. God delights in his people. The prophets portray a God who dances, a God who sings with joy. So oftentimes, amongst all the Advent and Christmas traditions and celebrations and all that kind of stuff, we know that central to it is singing. Christmas carols and the songs that we hear, that we play, that we sing together. But we may not think about God singing over us. What does God sing? Verse 18, I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. I'll move on in just a sec, but Um, have you mourned the loss of appointed festivals in the last two years? Weddings, vacations, graduations, birthday parties, trips, anniversaries. Part of the pain, a very real pain of these last two years is not only that we haven't had some of those things happen, we also haven't had them to look forward to. There's a lot of psychological work that's been done around the idea that we get just as much, if not more, happiness from planning a good experience than we do from actually having the good experience. Mapping out the road trip, planning the big party, anticipating, looking forward to, visiting all the websites and whatever it is that we're going to go there. So not only have we not been able to go on the trips and have the parties and celebrations, we've been robbed of the opportunity to anticipate those things. And God says, that pain from your loss of appointed festivals, that burden and reproach for you, that's part of what I'm going to be dealing with here. He sings on. I won't try to sing in God's voice. I'll just read his words. (laughs) You're welcome. At that time, I will deal with all you, all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. So you see an image of God here that bears no resemblance to Aristotle's unmoved mover, if that idea makes sense to you, or, to, or kind of this idea that there's a divine watchmaker out there who kind of winds the whole thing up and then lets it go. This is a God who is deeply moved. This is a God who is deeply affected by human attitudes and actions. This is a God who doesn't watch from a distance indifferently, but he enters into the life of the world. This is a God who comes to us in human flesh, in the mystery and the wonder of the incarnation. This is a God who sings over his people. And so when we go back to the beginning and we say in the time of social and spiritual crisis, in the moments of our greatest disappointment, pain, and loss, 
Which is it? Either God is good, but he's not powerful, or God's powerful, but he's not good. All of a sudden we go, I don't know what the answer is, but I know what the answer isn't. It can't be that God doesn't care. The incarnation gives us this incredible, beautiful, compelling picture. Not of a distant, disassociated God, but a God who enters the life of the world. And he promises, last verse, at that time I will gather you. At that time I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. There will come a day where we no longer live in the time between the times. There will come a day where we no longer have to practice being hopeful and joyful in the midst of social and spiritual brokenness. That day will come. But until then, we live with this hope. That ultimate invitation of something to look forward to. Something to plan for something to dream about. The thing itself, but it's also the anticipation of the thing in which God invites us to find hope and to find joy, that it's not gonna last forever. Zephaniah is a book that includes judgment and rejoicing. It's not one or the other, it's both. Which sounds a lot like the world and sounds a lot like my life and I'm guessing sounds like yours as well. First two and a half chapters are bad news. This last seven verses, it's good news. And it's a picture of God in his love at the end of this little book that's designed to crack our hearts open with its beauty. And say, whatever it is that you think about God, whatever questions you have, that's okay. Ask them, engage them, bring them. But in the end, the clearest picture we have of him is the picture that we have in Christ. Close with one of my favorite pictures from Robert Capon. God is not our mother-in-law coming to see whether her wedding present China has been chipped. He's funny old uncle with a salami under one arm and a bottle of wine in the other. We do indeed need to watch for him, but only because it would be such a pity to miss all the fun. So we watch, we wait, we grieve, we mourn, but we do so with hope. And in the midst of it all, my imperfections and the imperfections of the world, the invitation is to rejoice and to be glad, to sing, to celebrate, and to come to the table. God says, at that time I will bring you home. When we picture gathering at home, back home, where we belong with the people to whom we belong, That picture almost always has something to do with gathering around the table, that we are home. And uh, Pastor Amy is going to come and lead us to God's table this morning.